illegal. I promise. <laughs> okay, so is it in the right? Uh, like, yeah, I think it's 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 okay. Now, uh, are we are we live? Yeah. Hello. Hey everyone. Yeah, I'm, hey I'm everyone. missing five five viewers. Is that just like? Uh, it's probably uh, it's probably accurate. accurate. Yeah. But yeah. Probably us. Yeah. It's probably <laughs> oh, us. six yeah. six viewers. There is not that many of us. That guy just logged in. Somebody like needs to turn off their mic because the stream is. Uh, oh dang. Yeah. I can hear myself over and over. So. Yeah. That's uh. I I can hear. Okay, uh, Arvin, do you have the live stream like actual browser window up somewhere? Oh, hello, Dory. And Sam. No, I don't think so. Like uh, okay, I'm excellent. just using Procast. Hello, Duran. Uh, what's, uh, so this is our uh, pre-release uh, stream before we just go into full crunch mode to get the game ready. So yes. this is all. Uh, uh, so this is basically us before we go into our development uh, hibernation kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so any f uh, questions that you have uh, for us, just type them in the chat and we'll respond. Otherwise, we'll show you a bit of the game here and there. Mm -hmm. So this is just a, a random segment from the game, trying not to uh, spoil anything for you. Um, how is everybody doing? Yeah, we are uh, stressed out more than anything because, like, all of us have been working on this game for almost exactly a year because our kickstarter ended on i think it was june the 22nd and our game will be out on june the 13th so we'll have pretty much been working on this for one year or so so yeah ton of work and all of us are really nervous uh yes. nervous nervous productive super productive wrist pains nervous but also really happy and really proud of what we've done so far yeah at least i am yeah. for sure yeah like i you want to know the most like conceited egotistical moment i've had in the entire run of this game has been uh, i was i recently i started a place escape torment run and i was like our game there's things our game does better than this one yeah, that's kind is totally not uh, short expectations through the roof here, but okay, yeah. <laughs> opinions endorsed by Rutskarn are not necessarily opinions endorsed by Paradactyl Games. Please take all opinions endorsed by Rutskarn with a grain of salt. Yeah. Well, uh, I had a weird moment reading that article on Edge where they were talking, of course, Edge, uh, was that Edge magazine, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, that was Edge, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a really good article, but I had a weird moment yeah. reading it where they were like, we will see as development continues, and then immediately after reading that, I sat down and continued development, and I went, whoa, that was weird. <laughs> I <laughs> as they talk about it. It predicted the future. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah some, uh, somebody might want to link that article in the chat so people know what we're talking about. Hmm? Uh, that article oh. is actually, like, uh, for our backers, it would be, like, you guys... You guys would probably be very happy reading that because it's it's a really positive article. Yeah, although I will say I think that article, like the one thing that I was reluctant about linking it from, is because I feel like it misunderstood a few things about the world, like the game, like a, a few small things, like from their small sample size. I don't know. Let me see if I can find the link. I already posted it. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. yeah, we, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry for the uh, intermittent lag or so. We are trying to figure out why that is. Like, yeah, we've sort of been trying to figure out why that was yeah. from like the first couple streams. Yeah, it gets weird. Like sometimes it just happens. Like I I'm not sure why that is exactly. 
So anyway, yeah, for this stream, we'll just roam around in the levels. We won't talk to anyone in order to avoid any spoilers. But yeah, so we'll just show you, show off the environments a little bit. And, and you will get an idea of the game structure and everything. But yeah, we'll try to avoid any overt uh, spoilers. Yes. You know, the one thing I will say is that it, like, compares us to Papers, Please, in the sense that, like, you're, you're at the mercy of a social structure. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, to, to, you know that, that, that's certainly true to an extent in, in some chapters. Like, in some chapters, that's very much the case. But there are other chapters where it's almost like you are the, like, Aristotska. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's more what we're going for. I'm like, well, yeah, it sucks to be like a subject of this authority, but it also kind of sucks to be the authority. Yeah, and I mean, the key thing, I guess, is not so much like you don't play as the authority because you are kind of a person who's just, uh, it's kind of like the person who is supposedly in charge might not be as in charge as people might think. Well, it's yeah. contrary to the usual video game trope where nobody is the authority. No one person can be that. Even if yeah. you're in charge, you you don't run the world. Whereas yeah. Yeah. in many games, the misconception seems to be that if you become in charge, you literally control everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, especially like, in most RPGs where it's like uh, somebody, let's say some uh, like somebody takes over by killing over the previous thing. So then yeah. suddenly they just like become masters of the universe, kind of. Yeah, they're, everybody they're starts forwarding letters to that guy's house instead of the other guy's house. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's no like, uh, wait a minute, what just happened? And there's no other people trying to think, wait, why this guy? Why not me? Or something. Yeah, yeah, because when you introduce chaos into a system, it becomes a much less stable system. Yeah, and there are many others like who will try to like take power when it's like, when when a situation is where you can sort of. Uh, like, uh, you know, like, uh, take over, then everyone will want to do that. This. I guess what we're saying is there's some really weak-ass political philosophy in mainstream yeah. fantasy role-playing scenarios. They, they play up character choice so much that they don't really pay attention to the reality of the situation. And by reality, I don't know if you just mean realism, I just mean, like, believability, plausibility. Yeah, similitude is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So we are totally not going to trigger this scenario because this is spoilers. But we'll just hang around yes. a little bit, so people can try to figure out what it what what this is about. All about. Those people are like I, I'm. At, we, we're probably going to change this a little bit. Those people are well, maybe just a little bit too evenly spaced. No, I think <laughs> like they kind of look like they're about to break into dance. I I had them sort of on on it. Even a bit more, Arvin was like make them straighter, make them more like no, lines. I so I did. Like the, the like the cues generally are very ordered. Uh, so, so because uh, what happens is that uh, the, like the reason these people are not, are not rowdy and stuff is because of the soldiers standing five feet away from them. So if you yes. have like so these soldiers are like oh yeah we we'll distribute food and stuff. So that time like misbehaving basically cost you your day's meal. So you'll fall in line. Like, Arvin just gave some crucial hints as to what was going on in that scenario. Yeah. It's a cafeteria. <laughs> it's, the school is out and good. <laughs> yeah, and the kids up front get the best meals. They're going quick. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, I've never eaten a cafeteria meal in my life. There was one in my school, and I never went to it. Uh, 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 like. Schools in India don't have cafeteria. We we take lunches for our from our homes. In college we did, but uh, like I, ironically, the college cafeteria was too far from the actual college, so it was like <laughs> easier to like go to your hostel and like eat food there. And and anyway, like yeah, it, so yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah, weird thing. Not really much of a cafeteria person here either. I yeah. guess I'm not the one then, because I really like cafeteria food. Really? Interesting. Yeah. I, like, I, I know a lot of people who said, yeah, I, I had to eat cafeteria food. Yeah. Because, you know, it's Nobody my says they, I like cafeteria I don't think I've ever heard anyone enthusiastic for cafeteria <laughs> food. Yeah. Well, <laughs> considering how little I weigh, I am pretty enthusiastic for food, full stop. <laughs> yeah. I've only seen one person actually imbibe cafeteria food in my presence, so... 
I've seen plenty of people in black cafeteria food, never with signs of apparent enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe yeah. it, it can be a nostalgic thing, because for some reason I really, really love airplane food, even though it's horrible. My gosh. But yeah, every no, time I'm eating you, it, you it's you're something cool is happening. <laughs> yeah, you What's next, it? hospital food? Yeah. I like yeah. airplane food too. Like I fly with American oh, Airlines, and they, they actually yeah. have some really good stuff. Huh. Wow. Well, I, I like the really bad kind of airplane food. The food's <laughs> bad, but you know, you're 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 on an airplane, so you know something cool is happening. Yeah, like it tastes. The fact that it tastes not very good just <laughs> is like part of it. It's like eating astronaut food. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's, of course, it's, this food doesn't taste good because I'm in fucking space. <laughs> exactly, it's it's a part of the experience. <laughs> you know, I kind of get it. There's like there's like a taste to airline food, like a very specific taste. This is reminding of the time I went to the states and I ordered a burger and they put down a burger that was like I felt like I had shrunk. It was double the size of a Canadian hamburger and the plate was double the size and the fork was bigger and I was just looking at it like. What? Have I walked into oh the land God, of giants? I, <laughs> I never feel more American than when I get a drink at a Wendy's because I don't know if you guys like I guarantee you that what is a small at a Wendy's is literally a large in other countries. Yeah, I can imagine because we usually have like a smaller uh, thing, uh, like smaller portions in India. Yeah, like our small cup is. Um, yeah. Like about the size of like the tip of your fingers to like about a couple inches below the base of your hand. Wow. <laughs> that is, that is amazing. Yeah. Quite a Russ, mm, say you. And like and, and is it true that like our Texan sizes are double American sizes? So if I go to Texas No, it's... that's not true. I've been to Texas. I've oh. I mm, maybe the Texan dudes will tell you that. Oh yeah. No, because it's kind of like Texas is the America of America. So. Yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard that. I've never actually visited Texas or anything, but I've heard that. Oh, Texans are nice people. Unless you're one of those people that Texans don't like. <laughs> you're no fault of your own. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, so fun fact, <laughs> one of my formative memories. Uh, it was a Dr. Phil episode where a woman went on Dr. Phil to protest about the fact that Dr. Phil, who I believe is Texan, was always <laughs> slacking Texans, and she decided to show up in a cowboy hat, cowboy boots, and a black collared shirt embroidered with pictures of cows and guns. <laughs> <laughs> so how did he act? Well, he just pointed out that she showed up in a cowboy hat, cowboy boots, and a black collared shirt embroidered <laughs> with cows and guns, and that was pretty much the end of the debate, actually. <laughs> yeah. Next time I go to Texas, I'm definitely getting spurs. <laughs> spurs. Can you even take those on an airplane? No, I don't think well, so. Well, I've been my time on an airplane. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> so by the way, I actually have no idea who Dr. Phil is, but I'm assuming it's some kind of talk show or something. That's an accurate guess. Yeah, he actually is a doctor. Um, he's a he basically gives people advice. Um, he sort of he talks like this, and you need to find solutions in your life. <laughs> Oh, I see. That was actually a pretty good impression. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, now we have moved to the same area but as a different character. So this is a thing which like happens a, a like quite often I'd say in the game in that you will be in the like same area but as a different character. Dr. Phil uh, the bonus level. Yeah, you will be Dr. Phil in the bonus level. Exactly. I'm not saying All there of is the main one characters thing. will go on a show asking for advice for their problems, and he straightens them out. Yeah. <laughs> you seem to convince yourself that this is a no-win situation. <laughs> and then also a bunch of Naga come to the show, and to basically the solution to the Naga is, have you tried being human? <laughs> yeah. 
you need to get in touch with your human side if you're going to get along. <laughs> you already have two eyes and two arms. You just have one big, long tail. Have you realize that literally almost all of every development stream is lying about our game? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not even, like, good lies. Yeah, it's, Not it's, even yeah. lies that make you want to buy you the game. Buy it's like... It. Like, Dr. Phil is mean, a playable character. April what are some other classes? Uh, it turns I mean, into a yeah. military shooter halfway through. Damn, I was just going to say that we haven't even shown the FPS part. <laughs> yeah, whatever happened to Duke Nukem Edition? Yeah. We terrifully <laughs> disabled the jumping mechanics. Yesterday. <laughs> huh. Okay, actually, fun fact, uh, we did have like, we did dig a, unearth, like, some early versions of Unrest in a recent meeting, yeah. and one of them did have jumping, and I have no idea why the fuck it had jumping. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. I've said this a million times, but Unrest used to be about playing as a princess, fighting dinosaurs with guns. I don't mean fighting dinosaurs with guns, I mean the dinosaurs had guns. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Beat me to it! Also, Orion Dino Horde. We we are going to do the expedition to the Barrier Peaks. DLC. Yeah, no, I mean once the game is out, like I would love to do a like retrospective thing on this because Unrest changed, uh, like basically three times, times no three times, like, yes. majorly. Uh, it, so this what you're playing right now is the third design, uh, from there. Yeah, this I mean, is actually the third major design. We had yeah. a. Few rapid fire designs, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. The first one was very similar to our previous game, obviously, uh, mm. because at that time you were just uh, starting from that engine. The second one was, uh, it was it, it was very ambitious. Like I'm just going to say, like mm -hmm. that game was uh, basically like too much of a thing. It was like an area of the side of Skyrim and stuff like that. So that mm. just wasn't yeah. possible for a team like that. So. This is a result of taking the good ideas out of all uh, the, the other ones and then putting this, uh, putting all of that together. So yeah, I mean it's 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 really interesting because like when uh, like when, because when I emailed Ratskan for the first time, I was basically in a very fevered kind of state and I was like, oh my god, this game's going nowhere. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. today when I email Ratskan, I am in a fevered state, and I'm like, this game's going nowhere. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> what a difference! <laughs> yeah, but anyway, yeah, it it was really. Uh, I mean, when I look at what what the game was one year before, and when I look at now, like I can't help but feel a little bit proud, because really, like, yeah, I mean, the game has come a long way, and like it's obviously partly due to the support of our backers. Uh, obviously not forgetting them but yeah like like we have t like each of us of the team have, have has learned so much during oh, the yeah. development of the game there was actually recently a point where i i um was rewriting the first few lines of the game like i was i i like one of the first things i wrote for this game was the first few lines like back in march of last year and by the way, every anything that from like when I signed on in March to like when we started the Kickstarter in June was irrevocably lost, and yeah. uh, had just never going to be never going to see the inside of the game. But uh, uh, so I was you know writing rewriting that I'm like wow this is actually way better than it was when I did it a year ago. Yeah. Well, true story. Uh, I'm the scripter, by the way. When I started working on REST, I did not know you could do logic in XML at, at all. Huh. And it's it's always been fun, like, working on the game more and watching the rave like errors and other things just kind of plummet precipitously. Although, obviously, I, I say this before Mick has tested Chapter 5, and uh, <laughs> he's kind of the bug whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's been awful nice not having yeah. those problems show up again. Yeah. Like, for all of us, yeah, and... Yeah, that because like that's the thing which like we uh, sort of touched upon that in our previous update in that uh, like like we are hoping this game is a success so we can do more games like this because yes. yeah because uh, like because like all of us have kind of gotten used to each other now like how we work and like our workflow 
and we have gotten used to the engine and most of the bugs have been ironed out and yeah and like yeah i yeah. love working with the team all of them are very nice that part is obligated by contract but yes. <laughs> but and yeah. and even even if we all wouldn't be so nice to each other and liked each other we've actually gotten to a i think a very productive stage yeah. where the team is working awesomely and if you want to like make the next game with another team then you're going to have to start developing that completely from the start all yeah. over there's yeah. really no point yeah. to do that yeah that's no, definitely a, a thing know. where uh, like like teams uh, teams start and like teams grow during development they learn about each other they get comfortable with each other and then and then they start spark yeah and then at the end the executives fire them so we were yeah, very much like just to about to bring that, that up yeah. that's where indies have triple a game development lick they triple yeah. a game development seems to be very much like a you you're done okay now you go out the door we might hire you back for the next thing but with yeah. this many different people whoever we can get mm. on the cheap and then yeah. i imagine the productivity really is sort of bottoms there yeah yeah it depends on the team but you can't change things yeah with, with, us, it's like, with, with us it's like it's it's like you can't like fire you, us. You nobody's paying our salaries. <laughs> Nobody. We don't have salaries. Arvin, how many times have you fired me? <laughs> I think seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's <laughs> always yeah. always time for a few more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can squeeze one more in before release. Yeah. No, but I I think uh, even without the changing of the people in the major AA teams, uh, another problem is that the teams are so huge that uh, people can't ever get used to each other and actually develop like mm -hmm. a really good proper workflow with each other. <laughs> you normally have yeah. cells working with each other, sort of like a 20-person cell who are all really good friends, like the art team, the animation team, the programmer team. And occasionally you'll get like a few people crossing over between teams and being like the negotiator, but yeah. In a 100-man studio, not everyone's going to know everyone. I, it yeah. made me wonder, actually, I played Assassin's Creed 3, and that must have, just from the feeling I got, been the biggest team developed game in the history of the universe because yeah. every aspect of the game felt like it was done on a different planet from every other one and they communicated by telegraph. It was like you could see mistakes where the this the person writing the script for the dialogue didn't talk to the voice actors, didn't talk to the people making the cinematic, didn't talk to the people that made the level before the cinematic, and there are inconsistencies on every level of it, <laughs> which compounded in a scenario that just made no sense. I might write a blog yeah. post about it. It was it was pretty funny. Yeah. And this is something I think we've got licked in because. I, I know it was the case with Wolf Five Food. I knew everything about that game, but um, I'm sure Ross and Russ right now know everything about the game because I'm just sort of doing small stuff on the side for them. Yeah. So so anyway, yeah. Like uh, what I was saying was that uh, we hope and we hope that uh, like we get enough word of mouth uh, kind of thing. And obviously, our backers are very important for this to spread the <laughs> word, just so we can continue what we're doing. Because our team, like, is not at the stage where we can, like, just sort of, you know, uh, like, if 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 a game like completely bombs, then we are kind of like not going to be able to continue, or it's going to come out of somebody's pocket. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, like, let's hope, let's see what happens. But yeah, like, uh, I think, like, and I I get that's a general feeling because. All of the previews that we've gotten, all of the coverage we've gotten has been pretty positive. And like the feedback we got at the expo, like some of our backers played the game and they were very impressed. So yeah, I have a feeling that yeah, like we are we have made something special. And yeah, that is totally me being modest here. Like yeah, that's me modest. Like you should ask my team what I'm like when I'm boasting. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> But yeah, the backers, you've been a great help to making the game get made, but yeah. it's yeah. a product and it needs to be sold, and yeah. if we don't make money back from the game, we can't really keep doing this, so... Yes. And I mean, like, I personally am very happy with 
every single backer that we have because yeah. uh because really like they, you guys have been super supportive and like i yeah. couldn't have asked for a better crowd mm. uh, yeah we've we've been grateful for every single person who's back to our game yeah except for that guy that one guy <laughs> everybody else we're very grateful for your service. yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, sam asks us how long does it com- take to complete the game so sam uh, unrest has been in development for some form for two years like that's 24 months I that's, think they might be asking yeah, how long does it take for them to complete the game after oh, yeah, so hours right. of gameplay. Yeah. Uh, oh, we right. actually have no idea yet, quite yet. We haven't like had anybody Measures, go through yeah. all of it start because, to finish. Hmm. Uh, because the thing is like some choices which you can make can get you killed rather quickly. Yeah, there's yes. one particular chapter I remember which I I've tested a few times and every time I've died during it, like playing it properly for myself. Yeah. And that chapter can end very quickly if you get yourself killed. Um, you can you go through the game yeah. very fast. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like, or you can like, like play it for very long. So, but just as an estimate, I'm going to say four hours, just as a complete. Yeah. And but like the, the thing that must be emphasized is that that's not all of the content. To see all yeah. of the content, you will have to play through this game at least uh, two, maybe three times. So I don't know, maybe five, since like the fir- even the first chapter you can complete in a few yeah. good few ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, to tell you, uh, like to give you an idea, like the first chapter of the game, the first major chapter, that can end in twelve different ways. So twelve yeah, different and- endings for just the first chapter. So that's a lot of uh, like content that you won't see in a single playthrough. It's also not just like a straight line and then an ending choice. It's yeah. it's definitely a breadth rather than a length game where you can yeah. go through and complete the chapter in a completely different mindset and have different things happen and other things can happen contingent on those things that happen first. Yeah. In that sense, like the game we are most uh, inspired by is like the Deus Ex, the original Deus Ex. So that had the kind of a similar thing to in which one mission could end in very weird ways. So that's the feeling we've kind of kind of tried to replicate, but with a top-down uh, isometric style RPG, kind of. So yeah, roughly four hours for a single playthrough, but we definitely recommend uh, playing it more than once and then taking different choices, see where they get you, because that's yes. where like I think the game shines in the choice segment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although there's something that should be said for people who do, and I know this kind of person that exists, who prefer to play through like one time as their definitive playthrough. Like they're super, like they, they want, like they want like one set of choices to be their only memory of the game, and that's that's valid. I don't like playing that way so much myself, but like. You know, I always feel like I'm that's... missing out on another story that I could be experiencing. Yeah, mm, especially in this game. Leaving stuff on the table. There is a lot like, that can be left on the table. It it does depend on the game, of course, because there are a lot of games where you can say something, you know, three you have three options, but they all say the same thing. I don't really feel feel compelled to go back and check those options out because I know it'll be the same thing or a minor difference. Yeah, but I do it, that less, much yeah, less in this game. But when it comes to games like Unrest, it's it's more like I'm actually missing out on entire quests and plot branches and things like that. Yeah. And the more of those there are, the more compelled I am to go back and play it again. Yeah. So, like, the one thing I was talking about earlier, like, being better than, actually just, like, the one improvement we sort of make over a lot of old games is that, like, or even, like, a lot of more recent Bioware stuff, like, I really, I'm getting really sick of the thing where you talk to someone and you get, like, four questions that you can ask them about things and then you can just re-ask them and re-ask them and then, like, maybe you'll get one actual decision to make like about a response that you get to choose that you can hand back to them. Mm. And, it yeah, doesn't feel I, like I, a real conversation. Yeah, well, it certainly doesn't feel like a real conversation. It's also just really boring. You know, it's there should there really should be a way to deliver exposition without just doing nothing but delivering exposition. This is this is just 101 in any other medium and just yeah, not it, in video games well, except anime. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it, it doesn't flow. It uh, 
Yeah, you, you show up to someone, you, and the first thing you get is like, tell me about this, tell me about that. How does how your culture function? And it seems like the strangest, most out-of-character thing, but the player yeah, like wants that information. Yeah, like an anthropologist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I just yeah. don't understand how every other medium has figured out you can you 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 can tell information about the setting and area like through the plot and this you know video and games the not primary so character much. and also the thing is though that seems to come from like a lack of trust in their uh, in the player to work things out on their own or the player the you know the audience. Yeah, but it's, like, re often really straightforward. And, like, I love writing in games, but even, like, in Planescape, where the things you're learning are really interesting, you know, it, it gets tiresome finding everybody in the room and asking them every question just to see if they have a unique perspective on, like, the fact that there's no roof or that the special is chicken today. Yeah. So, yeah, publicly Secret asks me, by the way, Arvind, I was wondering how your culture functions. So that's a bit of a general purpose question, I guess. I mean, for most purposes, it's the same as like you guys, I guess. I mean, it's the same yeah. as whatever country you're in. So I mean, I don't know. Like, some specific. <laughs> is there some specific part which which you want to ask me about? Because I think yeah, I think you missed. You missed a great opportunity to say uh, fine. Thank you. How does yours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, because, yeah, like, because I, even I don't know how all of my culture functions. Like, it's not like, it's, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, I was a reference to Rapscar. But, yeah, in fact, yes. no, yeah, yeah, no, this is actually a thing where, uh, uh, like, which we want to, like, emphasize in unrest is that, like, it's not like you, a person can just drop in from the sky and be like, this is how the problems are solved. Thank you very much, you know. So all of like the problems in unrest are complicated. Like and in most cases, in fact, I, I I'll almost say in all cases, chances are you won't be able to solve them, even if you try your very best. There is no win option in the dialogue. Like you, there are trade-offs. Like you have to see if this thing is appropriate, or if that thing is appropriate. You have to make compromises, because that's how like kind of reality functions in a bit. Yeah, the third chapter is a really good example of this, and I won't yeah. spoil anything. I mean, in a, even the first one, for example, because and the fifth one, and the second one, and the fourth one. Yes. Yeah, all of them, in, in fact, because yeah, that's one thing which we uh, all of us are kind of see uh, like uh, like we don't tend to find that in video games very much. Is that uh, like most like most typical solutions just happen to be talk to two people and just it's like in most video games the thing that pisses me off is that the problem most of the time seems to be a communication barrier as if like two two warring factions just need one person to uh, shuttle between the, their two cities talk talk stuff out and like and everyone will be fine you know it's like the after school special moral of the game yeah or alternately, one side is just completely reprehensibly evil and needs to be destroyed. Yeah. yeah. And th there is no there is no moral quandary about destroying them. They're like they literally subsist on dead children and are powered by fire. Or something. Fire is like, like, hey, do you want to make a darker, edgy role playing game where there are no are, are no right decision, right and wrong decisions, and there's plenty of ethical dilemmas? Great. Now let's make the villain faction the fucking dark spawn. <laughs> yeah, demons from hell. Yeah, let's make the villains. Literally yeah. demons from hell led yeah. by a demon dragon to take over the world. Yeah. And not one of them talks. Yeah, exactly. There is at I mean, I think in Dragon Age Origins there was one point where the, you could talk to uh like a dark spawn for a bit or a dark spawn or a demon like that was where they I had think it was a demon, and that game. one annoyed yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. There was a and demon, and all of your conversation options were like, "You suck, demon." Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I it wasn't like, "How do demons work?" Hmm. <laughs> I think this is why the Souls games are pretty popular right yeah. now because there isn't really evil in the Souls games. Yeah, it's pretty much like everyone is fucked equally in, in the Souls games. Hmm. Yeah. 
So yeah, the guy. I suppose Demon Souls is a bad guy, but that's about the only one. Yeah, and I think yeah, this is a common uh, yeah the communication gap problem is one which we specifically wanted to tackle because uh, because the, ultimately like if you think of like okay why don't the two sides just sit down and talk to each other? Chances are if they are realistic factions, as in not totally evil, they have probably tried that, and so and something's not working. So we want to uh, like address that and like. And at the same time, we also wanted to, and this was uh, partly because of a budget constraint and because of our vision. Like it's just like we is that we wanted to keep the conflicts personal, not as in like your kingdom is being invaded by evil or like this or that. It needs to be personal. You we wanted to put you in the position of the of the characters you're playing as. And at, actually, that's a good point. Oh, go on first, though. Yeah, and at the same time, we wanted to provide you all of the choices which that character can realistically have in that scenario. And like, obviously, we are going to miss a few choices. Like, I mean, we can't possibly think of everything, but yeah, most of the choices we like, we hope we have most of the choices in there. So the idea is to put you in that character's shoes, give you all of the choices that that character would have, and then. Uh, let you see uh, what value those choices have in that social system. So yeah, hopefully that's that's because usually like it's not as simple as there's a conflict and you resolve it and then everyone lives happily ever after. It's not like most case scenarios are not as simple as that. So yeah, Ross, you were saying something. Yeah, I have yet to play a game like a you know video game mature enough to have. A nation that you start in become conquered by another nation, and that nation not to be overthrown by the end, or to be some sort of evil empire. There's never been a situation in a video game that I can recall where your like your authority that you've worked under or lived under for however long has been conquered, and then been replaced by somebody else, and it's simply changed and not being like the city's on fire or something like that, or there's oppression Mount everywhere. It happened to me in Mountain Blade, but yeah. I don't think that really Mountain counts. Mountain Blade. Well, Mountain Blade is it's just like a simulation game. The fact is that the, the factions are entirely pointless. Like, and, like, they have different units, and that's really the only difference. I, I suppose it can happen in an Elder Scrolls game, but that seems more like less a narrative concern and more of like a, oh, well, we can swap the guards out sort of deal. And honestly, I don't pay attention to the plot in Mountain Blade. I'm too busy blasting Matt Horn and gliding <laughs> people down. Yeah. <laughs> It always seemed to me like the um, the first person, more personal Crusader Kings. I'm not yeah. sure if that would be an apt comparison. Yeah, Mr. Starter has a, has a great point about factions. In that, like, uh, most faction systems, like he states, uh, Team Deadly Shadows, uh, you do a few fa favors for the hammers, and these fanatic priests <laughs> come to help you out when you fight the city watch. And yeah, like, that's a... In fact, like one of our scenarios in the game is about that. Like, if you try to make an exception for a person like that, don't yeah. want to spoil it. Yeah, but but yeah. So so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not to mention they fight the city watch at the same time as the pagans five feet over in the city park poke their yeah. heads out and go, "What's going on over here?" And then there's a four-way brawl between them and some uh, <laughs> some keeper assassins that showed up at just the right moment. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, and, uh, and we'll also have a, a few, uh, some other news uh, related to Ste the Steam release for you backers, which like, we are 99% sure we are on Steam, like the 1% the is always yes. just to cover our asses, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the 1% of germs you don't eradicate when you spray them with Febreze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, uh, good news coming on that front. And yeah, now just uh, like it's just the final stretch. That's always uh, the most uh, like the most challenging and the most exhilarating at the same time. I mean, if you are the sort of a uh, person who like gets excited by making video games, which at least all of us are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, I. I... I should hope we are excited by making games. 
here. So uh, yeah, uh, any other questions? Uh, if you have so, we have about yeah, we are in in here for a good twenty or so minutes more. So yeah, any questions you have, just throw them our way. Mm -hmm. I might actually need to leave a little before then because I need to go go back home and visit my parents. But uh. Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. To get out traffic, yeah. like. Well, yeah, I'll just leave the questions in a chat while we just, uh, okay, what's the official elevator pitch? So you can tell them about the, okay. The official elevator pitch is, it's Pulp Fiction set in ancient India. Now, if that doesn't get them interested, then nothing else will. That doesn't get them interested, then offer them a cash reward. We will reimburse <laughs> you. We will not reimburse you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. It could also yeah. be the wire. Yeah, in fact, the wire. The wire in ancient India is a pretty good pitch. Yeah, the like, wire. Yeah, that's. Actually I would say that is. I am really hesitant about saying that that is accurate because we are as good as David Simon, but I will say that <laughs> that is absolutely accurate to our goals. Yeah. The wire is probably the show that has influenced my like the, my, philosophy of this game the most. Yeah, no, I definitely, yeah, as soon as Ross said, I was like, yeah, why didn't I think of that one before? That's always what I've thought of it as whenever yeah. I thought of the plot. Yeah. That's good. Well, that, that's good, because, yeah. I mean, you so, came on after the dev stage, so if that came through, then, like... Yeah. And, and uh, the, a little bit, uh, that's the one-liner elevator pitch, the wire in ancient India. The a slightly larger one is, it's a plot and choice-based advent, uh, adventure role-playing game set in ancient India. That's about putting characters in tough situations and then giving them the freedom to explore and perhaps get out of those situations. Yes. Third elevator pitch, they don't buy it. It has snake people. Yeah. Fourth elevator pitch, <laughs> they're really cool guys. Just like so cool. Yeah. Fifth elevator pitch, wait, is this elevator working? What do they call like quarter pounder with cheese in ancient India? Uh, like we, <laughs> that's a funny thing because we actually, uh, like yeah, at least in modern India, like you don't get a quarter pound of cheese like that. You, you either get cheese cubes or you get cheese slices. No, <laughs> a quarter pounder is a quarter pound hamburger that has a slice of cheese on it. Oh, that's what it means, right? Oh yeah, so so then yeah, so then it's like, yeah. I mean, I guess it's like it's available at McDonald's, I guess. I mean, whatever that is. Yes, I can't believe you didn't know that. <laughs> no, like, I, this is the first time I've heard that. Like, I, I know what a, like, when when Samuel L. Jackson or uh, Vincent Vega said, said that in Pulp Fiction, I assumed they meant uh, those big blocks of cheese, the round ones, that weighted yeah. a quarter pound. So that's why you said. Oh, like a it. cheese wheel. Yeah, yeah, I thought that meant a cheese wheel. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's what I mean. That's what I thought always. Yeah. The mental uh, image of that is fantastic. Like just walking just Samuel L. Jackson just unwrapping a, a cheese wheel and being like, "Raw hell, cheese." <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. That is a tasty. Food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but yeah, I mean that's just okay. So so I mean yeah, that completely pull like makes me reinterpret all of Pulp Fiction now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Like, I, I would imagine if you asked me some, some other stuff about like, th like normal uh, like usage of words, you'll probably consider that hilarious as well. Because like, yeah, like the 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 only way I know of America is from like uh, sitcoms and stuff, and like some TV shows. Yes. So, I've actually had some very <laughs> interesting discussions with people who only yeah. know the United States for sitcoms because, <laughs> like, obviously there are things in the sitcoms that, like, they know don't really happen or yeah. aren't really true, but there are things, that, like, that people don't really question. And, like, one thing that some people don't question is, like, that the sets in sitcoms, like, that's not guaranteed to at all be representative of how large your living space is going to be. Yeah, yeah, I always, I always wanted to ask that. How much do sitcom homes look like? Average American homes because 
almost never do they actually look like that. For one thing, usually they have too much nice shit in them. Yeah. I, I think another thing is that uh, usually the sitcom characters spend like 90% of their day hanging around with friends in that extremely nice apartment in somewhere new in New York and don't actually have a job. How are they paying for it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. I guess they're all like trust fund kids or something. <laughs> like that's the only thing yeah. I can think of. The rich By the way, rich if every sitcom set, like if every sitcom apartment, like that was supposed to be in New York, <laughs> was actually from New York, that apartment cost like a million dollars a month. <laughs> well, hey. Property is super crazy expensive in New York. Yeah, I remember actually seeing an article on actual castles that cost less than certain properties in New York. My God, yeah. <laughs> like 17 room fortresses you could buy that, that have, you know, in Germany somewhere. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't mind living in a castle in Germany. Like, I think that would be actually quite cool. I mean, compared to a New York apartment, definitely. They are yeah, I mean, the place would be cleaner, and then you'd have trust fund issues, and then you wouldn't be able to get to work because you'd have to, you know, use yeah, a car to drive 17 miles over your moat. No, but here's what I, what I would do. Like, I would be like, okay, guys, you all work in a boring office. I have a fucking castle, so all of you drive to work in my castle now. And, like, nobody can argue mm -hmm. against that because I live in a fucking castle. So... I mean, I'll probably like to force my point. Like, whenever I go into the office, I'll get myself accompanied by two officially dressed guards, kind of thing, in fancy colored clothes, like bright red or bright orange or something, and be like, the, my security doesn't allow me or something. Mick, I think taking Arvin to Buckingham Palace was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> No, I I actually really want a castle as well. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah, we, yeah, we should I, probably, I, yeah, I've we been should probably, yeah. I I've been looking at those advertisements. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm just just okay, getting, so uh, uh, we get a Kickstarter to finance a castle in Germany for us. Yeah. That's what our next Kickstarter <laughs> is going to be about. Yeah. It's crazy. Enough to work. Video game, video game mogul of Toronto. I'm I'm probably going to buy mean, castle when I live there. <laughs> The funny thing is, uh, the headquarters of FIFA, the football organization, they are at the bottom of a vol volcano. Of a, like, uh, they're not an active volcano, but in a bottom of a volcano. So, I mean, yeah, you, you can just like insert your evil organization jokes here at this point. But yeah, like, I want an office like that. Yeah. Press the lower leagues of football today. <laughs> yeah. That's just. Uh, that's kind of like, do you know if they are like renting the Alamo or something? Like, <laughs> uh, I think that was an invention of TF2. <laughs> yeah. No, I've been to the Alamo, it definitely exists. <laughs> yeah, Funny so, story um, yeah. oh, about working space. Oh, go on. Uh, no, so when 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 lost type from the Canadian Renaissance of 1902, the first question was, wait, there was a Renaissance, and the second question was, wait, there's Canada in 1902? <laughs> yeah. Technically, no. <laughs> there wasn't actually a Canada. It was it was referred to as Upper Lower Canada, I oh, think. Technically, it was part of the United Kingdom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was my point. It, we weren't yeah. technically uh, our own country until much later, but oh. there was actually a Canada. There was a place called Canada. Oh, I see. Yeah. God, when was Confederation? I, <laughs> I, my history sucks. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I think your history sucks. I'm still convinced that we own your country because you still have our queen. That's a good okay, point. Wait, but like, if Canada has the queen, then why isn't the top left corner of their flag the Union Jack? The top left corner of almost all of our territories is actually the Union Jack. But not the main flag. Uh, no. So why that? I, I think that changed at some point, and I'm not sure why. Or Well, I, I, I understand why, but I'm not sure when. Huh. Interesting. So, 
So it's kind of like uh, Ukraine, like it's like Canada doesn't want to like acknowledge that it's it still accepts the Queen. So the major flag is in <laughs> like the union, like one quarter's Union Jack. But inside they're like, okay, we we'll just keep the Britishers happy. Well, I know as, as early as World War II, we still had the uh, the Union Jack, I think, as a flag. Oh. Yep. Oh, yeah, because like in India, it's kind of the the opposite. Like as soon as the Britishers were like out of the door, we removed the Union Jack from every single flag we could find. <laughs> so we were just like... Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, like, it was yeah. in uh, 1965. Oh. oh, go on. No, so so yeah, like because it was like, yeah, we don't want to like acknowledge the Queen, like... Ian Nichols sucks, especially him. That's written in our constitution, by the way. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, yeah. So it's just that, yeah. It's weird when, like, because like we, like I, like as an Indian, I cannot think of any one reason why I would want to, like, still pretend that the Queen is our sovereign ruler. Like, why would I want to do that? I think it's probably because uh, we had like the driest, most like polite political split from England ever to the point where you barely even noticed at the time. I'm... Yeah, I guess that's yeah, why. I, I guess that's why. I guess. Hey guys, sorry, but I actually have to go now. Okay, yeah. It's anyway, yeah, yeah. we have, anyway, like, five yeah, we have like five minutes more. Make, make, you should mute your mic. Make, make you should mute your mic. I can listen to myself. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So it's our final five minutes anyway. So... Yeah, any final questions that you have, we'll take them. Okay, so yeah, just like you are, I guess this this takes some time to reach. <laughs> but yeah, any final questions? Five more minutes, final five minutes. Oh, that's that's too kind. Yeah, publicly secret is too kind. <laughs> Yes, it really is. Yeah. Or far Yeah, but yeah. That's why I love our backers because, like, I mean, if you told me that okay, uh, two roughly two thousand people from the internet are going to give you money to do this, I would be scared as hell. But mm -hmm. our backers are just so kind and so supportive, and that has made like making our game so much better for us. Mhm. Mm so I mean, yeah. yeah really, it's... Like, very possible that 2,000 people from the internet could give you money and then decide eight months later, where is our product? We want it now. Because yeah. instant gratification. But yeah, you guys have been amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I guess, yeah, on that, like, heartfelt thank you note, uh, we can conclude the stream. Yeah, thank you all very much for tuning in. And our next public stream will probably be the Pyrodactyl launch party. Yay, two, two. So, so yeah, like that would be like, yeah, we'll have to figure out ways to make that uh, like really special, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I guess we can like, uh, Ratskan can send some like, uh, like, you know, one of those things which like pop up whenever somebody like says America, so that confetti showers and stuff like that. Yeah. I know exactly what we're doing. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I'll tell you after. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, okay, thanks for watching and see you next time.